everybody, it's Tom, and I'm coming to you today to talk about phenomenology. Uh, what I am going to be doing, actually, over the next, probably end up being a two months or so, two or three months, because there's a lot of material. But what I'm going to be doing is going through two texts, uh, not necessarily in an entirely systematic fashion. Uh, one, and they're complementary, they're both put together under the... Uh, just of a uh, Moran, Moran, who is I think he's at the University of Dublin, and a competent scholar and practitioner of phenomenology in his own right. One is here the introduction to phenomenology, and then the complementary uh, phenomenology reader. So phenomenology, big word for those of you who are not familiar. With it, um, predominantly it's associated with a movement that originates really principally in the 19th, late, late uh, sorry, not 19th, principally it's a movement of the 20th century. There's some foreshadowing uh, in the 19th century. The real point of departure is with Ed Edmund Husserl, um, who took up a notion articulated by his teacher, Franz Brentano, regarding the nature of consciousness as fundamentally intentional in structure. Now, what do we mean by that? We don't mean the word intentional here after the fashion in which uh, it is encountered in colloquial speech. We're not talking about um, deliberate willed activity, at least not in an in a obvious way. Rather, it's actually vis-a-vis uh, -vis Brontano. Brontano actually took this up from um, the medieval notions uh, in scholasticism and even further back uh, particular reading of Aristotle. But uh, the, the, it's really not that complicated. What it means is that consciousness is inevitably about something. All conscious acts characterized by content if you like so you know if you're going to see you're seeing something if you're going to hear you're hearing something if you're thinking you're thinking something and so on and so forth Husserl wants to suggest if we're going to ground our conception of something like science and eventually he becomes I would say even more radical than that uh, what's necessary to return to an appreciation of how experience unfolds, especially in light of this intentionality. Now, the problematic which arises is that by hook and by crook, we have fallen out of step with our primordial, with our fundamental experience, so that we sort of miss Act, the, the manner in which objects actually present themselves to us. By the time we begin to articulate them in speech and in interaction, we have already appended or super added onto these objects uh, all sorts of classifications, categorizations, contextualizations uh, in a manner which actually sort of leaves us uh, at a distance from how life uh, unfolds in a direct manner. All right, so, you know, you can see a cup, right? Now, the attempt is it's, it's, it's a tricky sort of thing, right? Because uh, at first blush, one might be tempted to say, well, what you're really seeing is color, uh, you know, and that that color is in a vague shape and... The idea is that we synthesize all these qualities, but is that what really happens? What is really present in consciousness? What is the object? What is the intention? Is it the colors? Is it the, you know, is it the feel, the shape? Well, consideration actually brings about the surprising revelation that these uh, sensory aspects or facets, if you like, of the object are in our cognition actually abstracted 
from the fundamental experience in order to situate that object in a way that plays into other narratives with which we are trying to clothe the world. Because what first presents itself to us, whether we want to classify it as a cup, which is itself a reflection of being uh, ensconced in specific sociocultural context that identifies this sort of object after that manner, what we first encounter is an object in its wholeness, something folds or presents itself to us in a, a kind of totality which is uh, occluded by a fixation on its partial aspects. And at least for me, it's a very compelling manner in which to re-situate uh, how we encounter or experience the world. Um, I might add on to that an additional surprising consequence of these sorts of reflections and interrogations is a sort of disillusion of the traditional breakdown between the subjective and the objective. In time, through the tradition of phenomenology, this uh, pairing, this dyad, even becomes very broadly eschewed as uh, kind of missing the mark. The mark being the situation that objectivity is predicated upon subjectivity. Not in, not in a manner which translates into relativism. Uh, it's rather a, a, a subtler thing than that. The, the, the constitution of an object is, if you like, reliant on it exhibiting an appearance, a shining forth, if you like, to make a sort of, sort of tip my hat to the etymology of the word phenomenology or the word phenomenon shining forth within a space that we generally refer to as the space of the subject or subjectivity or consciousness. Uh, so Husserl is the guy who gets the ball rolling and uh, he's probably, you know, first up, well, actually, my next video before I get into Husserl proper, I'll approach um, Brentano, right, uh, who is his one of his major teachers and influence in the and Brentano is significant because he's the one who really sort of latches on to intentionality as a being of great power. For him, his project was related to the emergence of psychology, and he wanted to make a, a sharp distinction between, I believe he would call it descriptive psychology is an encounter of our direct experience and again his terminology is sort of genetic psychology which wants to understand mental acts as the outcome of so many physical and chemical processes the latter obviously uh, the descriptive approach is the one which in the sort of overarching or dominant tradition uh, really Weighted. Uh, what I think valuable about phenomenology is that it is a powerful uh, uh, corrective to the quote unquote objectivist tendencies of psychology, neuroscience, and, and science at large, where there is an effort to almost truncate experience of the subject in from uh, our account of reality. But the, uh, I, was, I think the insight of the phenomenologies, uh, of phenomenology, of the phenomenological movement of phenomenologists, the insight is that there is, uh, if you like, a fundamental relationship bet 
between our awareness and being itself. Or to put it in sort of more fancy pants words, that the um, ontological is connected inexorably to, I was going to say epistemological, but that's not quite the right word because you're, you're already importing certain implications there. Uh, but I think you, you, you get the gist. Anyway, that's what's going up. Uh, we're going to, you know, sort of work through phenomenology, um, major figures being Husserl and Heidegger, but there's lots of other cats uh, on the scene. Like most notably, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, Jean-Paul Sartre in the mix, uh, some guys like uh, Levinas, Derrida, uh, and, and, and many more besides. So we're going to interpolate that uh, journey probably with uh, other uh, subjects as well. But I just wanted to inaugurate the process by announcing intending to overtake it in a different sense of the word, and that we'll be leaning on the fine work, again, of Dermot uh, Moran, his introduction to phenomenology, and a complementary reader, and uh, we may also import some so-called primary texts along the way. So, that's all for tonight. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you guys on the flip side. Ciao for now.